Well hello again folks. As a few of you will know who've looked at my channel in the past, you'll know that I'm quite interested in old Hoover machines, having spent a large part of my life involved with Hoover and repairing their equipment. Well, a friend of mine, cycling friend, who knows this, uh, he was sorting out his late father's shed a couple of months ago and he found this old Hoover Dostette in there and he thought I might like it to add to my collection. Anyway, he brought it over and I was grateful to receive it. Uh, his father has actually reconditioned it so it's not in the actual authentic Hoover colours. But it's got the original black bag on. When it came, uh, the seal in the bag had gone but fortunately I've got a supply of those in my Hoover shed and I was able to put a new seal on and try it out. Now I'm going to plug it in first so you can see it working. Right, I'll turn it on. There we go. Actually runs quite nicely for an old machine. It has a little slide switch on the top. The early ones did have a rocker switch, but there aren't many of those about now. Consider this uh, model was produced, this particular one was produced in 1947 and it's still going strong which is what some 73 years later which is not bad considering. It, it's not originally, it's, it wasn't originally in these colours, they never did one with in all black as far as I know anyway. Uh, but the, my friend that gave it to me, his father was an electrical engineer and he did it up and he's done it non-standard colours. This would normally have been a grey or, or mottled finish or a silvery finish or some of them were even like polished aluminium which rather looked rather nice. The bodies were brown uh, and sometimes they were black and sometimes they were a silvery colour. They did change the colours but I've never seen one that was all black but it, it doesn't matter you know. It's a nice little job actually and uh, I could probably use it in the workshop. It's far better. The amazing thing is that when, the, when we were repairing these and when they were being sold uh, I uh, I never rated them very highly. I always thought they were very poor suction and uh, a bit pointless, to be honest. But now now I've actually tried it and compared to what you get today, I think it's actually quite a brilliant little thing. I mean, it's it's a nice thing. It's well made. It's nice to operate, and uh, in the bag's nice on it. But original bag, that's surprising. So what I'm going to do, I've got a couple of other machines here I'm going to show you. I'll unplug that one out of the way. Okay. Now I've also got this one. This, uh, this is another of my old machines. Uh, most of these were ones that people brought into the shop years and years ago and they were scrapped for one reason or another. People used to bring them in and buy something newer and they threw these, oh can you chuck this away? And of course being a bit of a scrimper, I didn't like to throw them away, so I thought I'd bring them home. And then I thought, well, why don't I have a little Hoover Museum? I never got round to doing it, but I got a little shed and I put them in. And it's been languishing in there for over 40 years, this little Hoover. Now, I checked up on this one. This is the, obviously the brown coloured one. This was made in 1953. Um, and I, I don't know whether it works or not, but uh, we'll find out later. I've got this one here. This is, it's really the worst for wear. It's been stuck in the shed again for uh, oh, well over 40, 30 years. It's, it's worth the worst for wear. I have no idea whether it works or not. It's got one of our failed safety test labels on there that we used to put on when we condemned it for one reason or another. It could be that it was just a fault in the flex or the electric part or it could be the motor shorting out. I, I don't know but um, it's been in the shed for over 30 years now and uh, I've only just got discovered it basically. I've only just discovered it after 30 odd years. So uh, that's another one. So anyway, I'll put that down, get that out of the way. So what I've decided to do, I'm going to take this brown one. Uh, there's no flex on it obviously, so I can't try it at the moment, so I don't think it works. And I'm going to show you how to take it apart and what to look for, some hints and tips. It's quite a nice little cleaner. And it's all metal, and it appeals to me because it's all metal with just a bit of Bakelite. I mean it'll last forever basically compared to the plastic junk you get today that lasts for 12 months if you're lucky. So it's really good. So the first thing to do is to take the bag off which is just you just twist it like so if you can get it off. <laughs> they, they do get very tight actually. There we go. Now in, I'll just show you this because inside the bag 
there's a, a felt seal around there. That's the important thing to keep reasonable. If that wears out, you get dust bellows out from everywhere. So that is one thing. Fortunately, I've got a bag of those from the old Hoover days. So if I do get a problem, I've got spare. Now, the first thing to do is to take this little plate off on the top that holds a switch. So you need a medium bladed screwdriver for that. They're just ordinary screws. Be very careful with them because they do get tight sometimes. They've been in there for many years and you don't want to snap them off. So just turn them back a little bit and then just jog it backwards and forwards like that to just loosen it. Don't try ramming it straight out if it's tight. If it's loose, then it'll come out easy, no problem. So you undo the two top screws. What you want to do, if you uh, get a little tray or something to put the screws in so you don't lose them, because you're sure to lose some. I'll just put the screws in this little tray here for now. I'll just chuck it over there. Look. Okay. Now having taken that off, you're, you're, you can get to the switch. You can see the switch now. The switch is held on by two tiny screws in here, one that side and one that side. Now, really, the best thing to do is to take all the wires off because you, you're going to have a fiddle to get this handle off anyway. You've got to take the handle off to get to the motor. So I'm going to undo these screws here that hold the wires onto the switch. There's nothing complicated about it, so you don't need to write anything down. It's pretty straightforward. So take those two screws off. First of all, brass screws. Be careful with the screws because they do have different threads sometimes on the different parts of the machine. So there's the little switch. Got Hoover marked on it, look. It's the original Hoover one. And as I say, there are two little, two little tiny screws, one each side that hold it in place, the top plate. So we'll put that out of the way now, put that in the little tray. In the top here is the other connection, which is the neutral. So we'll take that screw out as well, get that out of the way. That will release the wires because it is a fiddle getting down the handle. Okay, now we've taken that one out. So we've got the wires out. Now, to take the, if you want to take the front off, just the front off, to get in to clean the fluff out, you don't need to do what I've just done with all that because what you can do is take this front screw out and then you can actually on this model get the front off without undoing that. So we'll do that first. Now you've got quite a large headed screw in there and they do get very tight because you've got to remember this is alloy and the screw's metal and, and you do tend to get corrosion. It's a job to get them out and you don't want to snap it off. So get yourself a broad bladed screwdriver and pop it in there and give it a turn. Now again, like I said before, don't force it. If it's a bit tight, just jog it backwards and forwards like this and eventually it'll come out. This one's not too bad. So I'm not doing that. There you go. So he's a bit rusty, but he's not too bad actually. Now, having done that, if your, your only aim is to get the front off, to get the fan or to clean it out, you can just swing that around like that because you've got to get to that screw there on the top. There's a screw there which holds this on, you've got to get that off. Now these screws do have a habit of, of snapping off, they get really tight, so what I would suggest you do, get your large bladed screwdriver and just do it gently like that, and this one's a bit tight, and just jog it back, don't try forcing it, just go backwards and forwards a bit like this, a little bit at a time, gradually you can ease it out. Now when you get it a few turns round, get a bit of penetrating oil, I've got a little jar of penetrating oil here. You're wondering why it's in a jar and not in a tin, uh, plus gas. Uh, the reason it's in a jar and not a tin is I had it in a tin uh, and it had a hole in it and it was all escaping so I put it in this jar. Get a little paintbrush, any little brush like that and just tip it over and just ease it around a bit of plus gas or penetrating oil. It doesn't have to be plus gas, it can be anything, there's bound to be other brands. And just sort of paint it around the screw and hopefully if you if you've got enough of the screw out it will actually penetrate down into the thread so again just rock the screw a few times like that it's gone easy already see and then that oil has gone into the thread and i'll be able to get it out there we go so you see that screw which was tight has now come out and then just repeat the same thing for the other two screws They'll, they'll probably both be tight if that one was. I'll just get me plus gas out the way or else I should knock it over and that'll be gone, won't it? Okay, that's the three screws out. Now you can get the front cover off. Now you'll find that will have corroded around there and it will be a bit tight. So if it's very tight, you can sometimes tap it like that. But the easiest way is just get a large mallet and just tap it carefully. Hold the motor unit and just tap it around like that. Carefully, obviously. There we go. And that's the front come off. Now, before we go any further, I'll just show you 
the front part. That's the inside of it, that dirt and dust. You can see it always corrodes around here where it fits on. Uh, on the front of the nozzle here, there is a little brush that's screwed on. As you can see, there are a few bristles left, but most of them are worn off. If you've got one of these and you haven't got a spare brush, uh, it's not a problem because it works fine without it. They don't really do much, those brushes, to be honest. I thought they were a bit pointless in a way. But um, you can change it if you want to. Anyway, that's that front cover off. Now, having got the front cover off, you can then get to the motor and the fan. You can take the fan off without doing any more just by undoing that nut. It will probably be tight, so it might not come off even with that. But in normal circumstances, you could have undone the nut and the fan would pull off and you could change the fan all clean behind it. But um, in this case, I've got to take the motor apart anyway because it's it, the bearings are tight. Now, one thing to mention about the duster is... If you find it doesn't pick up, do check around here because the dust tends to pack around the inside of the back cover here and round here. You can't always tell without taking the front off. You can look in that end and it looks clear. If you take the front off, you'll find that it's packed solid like felt all around inside there. And because the dirt and dust goes through there into the bag, it will not pick up. So you might have to take the front off if it doesn't pick up. Anyway, next thing we're going to take the motor out. So the next thing to do, you've got to get to the screw, which is under the cable, and it is a damn fiddle. It's right down inside there, it's a hell of a fiddle. But if you get your screwdriver out, sometimes you even have to take the cord grommet out to get to it. I think I've almost got that. You've got to take, there you are, there's the screw, look. As you can see what a fiddle it is, now that's where the cables come through that hole there. So I'm going to pull the cables through. There's the handle, I'll put that somewhere safely. And now we can take the motor out. Pull the motor out. There we are. You can get at the carbon brushes by undoing these. I'm just going to take one off to see. Be careful again that you don't break them. Use a wide bladed screwdriver. When you look at the carbon brushes on the motor, on this one, they're particularly shiny. They're nice. Excuse my hands, I've got a glove on one hand and one without, I just noticed. If you look at the carbon brushes, they're both nice and clean and shiny. That in indicates that the commutation has been working fine. There's been no armature reaction and no burning of the brushes. Clean brushes like that indicates that it's it's a good armature and the brushes are not sticking. If the brushes are, are badly worn in some places that usually means either the armature is faulty or it could even be that one of the brushes is sticking causing it to sort of lose contact and that will cause arcing uh, and will eventually wear the armature out. The next thing to do is to take the armature out with the fan so I'm going to undo these four screws around the front plate there and the whole lot should pull out. Now we can take these screws out. Again, be careful they're not jammed. This one's come out easy. You do not want to break them off. Anyway, I've got the four screws out. Now, by rights that should pull off, but it's probably going to be tight, you see. You should be able to pull it off with your hands, but it's been in there for years. So what you want to do is get something and give it a tap. If in doubt, give it another clout. That's my motto. And usually just comes... Oh, there we go. Got it. Well, there we are, folks. Now then, there's the armature, and that armature is in perfect condition. Look at that. Keep an eye on these washers, because there are various little spacer washers and things on the end of the armature. Um, and some sometimes stay... I can see there's one in there on the little back bearing. So you've got to be careful not to lose those, otherwise you'll have problems. And uh, as you can see, if you examine the, arm, the commutator, it's very clean and shiny apart from where the brush track is of course, but there is no indication whatsoever of any burning, so that is a very healthy armature, nothing whatsoever wrong with that. When, when the armature is, is faulty, you will notice that the, instead of these um, segments having square edges, if you look at it, and if you can see it from that position, I'll turn it around a little bit, you should see that they're nice square edges. If they're sort of rounded off and look a bit burnt, it usually indicates that the armature itself is faulty. <coughs> Here we have the little end plate. And you can see the bearing down in there. Uh, to get the bearing out, what you, that's if you could get another one, uh, you have to drill out the three rivets here, which are factory fitted obviously, and then you replace it with, um, with pop rivets. I, I imagine you know what pop rivets are. In case you haven't seen any, I expect most people have, these are pop rivets. Uh, and uh, you use them in a 
thing called a pop rivet gun. Obviously, this is a pop. This is my actual Hoover pop rivet gun. I, I know it wasn't. It's not actually made by Hoover. It's made by G Tucker Eyelet Company, Birmingham. It's a well-made product. I've had this for many, many years. It was supplied by Hoover Limited. You just pop your rivet in the end like so. And then when you pull that down, it forces the pin through and expands the end of the rivet. Very useful tool. I use it a lot in, in many of my projects. And I've had that thing now for probably over 50 years, I imagine. Good unit, that. If you haven't got one, get one. They're very handy. One thing I should have mentioned is when you're dismantling a motor, it's always a good idea to put a little mark on it. You see there, I've just scratched a little line on it with a screwdriver to get so that you assemble it correctly it does make a difference because things wear out in a certain way and it's always wise to replace it exactly as you took it apart so it was always the custom with Hoover service to mark it like that with a little line just scratch it with a screwdriver or something so that you could assemble it correctly it was more important with the the dustette because these holes don't actually line up if you don't get it correct It'll only go on one way, in other words, you've got a choice of four. If you, if you don't do it, I mean, you can easily turn it round and find out which one lines up and which one doesn't, But you, and you, you've got four choices, but if you put a little line on it, it solves the problem completely, so it's always worth doing that. Mark your motor before you take it apart. I don't know whether you can see that, but that's the field coil inside there. It's held on by two screws there, but it's a bit of a fiddle with the wires. Nobody likes doing them. If you want to change the bearing in the back, you've got to, of course, you've got to take the field winding out to do it. That's a factory fitted bearing, so it's original. This is an exploded diagram, an official Hoover exploded diagram of the Hoover 100 model. Uh, it shows the alternative front cover here that the later ones had, where they had, a, rather than having the fixed nozzle, like the early ones did, which was better actually, they had a, a plain nozzle and he used a Hoover all-purpose brush in the end. But actually, the original one, like we've got here, I think is a lot nicer. So that's the exploded diagram of it. If you're wondering what this large device here is, that's an external device. And when these machines were first produced, there was no suppression on them. And uh, obviously they could interfere with people with old radio sets and televisions and cause all sorts of interference and annoy people. So Hoover came up with this in-lead suppressor, which was a little device with some capacitors in, which you put in the lead of the dustette to suppress it and stop it interfering. The later models, the 2614 onwards, they had a built-in suppressor in the handle. They redesigned the handle to make room for it. Now this is an exploded diagram of the motor unit, and this is the end plate with the bearing itself here, and also the rear bearing is shown in this pit, this diagram here, there's the little bearing there, the Foster Bronze Bush, and uh, the motor case, and obviously in there's the field coils assembly. Carbon brushes and holders are shown here. The amazing thing is, in those days, you, you bought, if the bearing failed, you could just buy an individual little bronze bush. And amazingly, I've been through my stock, and I've actually found two of the actual bearings. These are the, this is the, the one little bearing. This is the one that goes in the front plate. And this is the one that goes in the back plate. I'm not going to change your mind because they're a fiddle. It's amazing how you could get all the individual parts today. It's difficult enough to get a motor unit for it, and even if, rather than the spares. And even if you can get a motor, uh, the cost will be so prohibitive, it's cheaper to buy a new machine. Now, I've covered all the dismantling and made a few comments about it. Uh, the next job is to put it all together again. Anyway, that'll, that's all for now. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.